Welcome to the Dear Lovejoy podcast. It's a special. Uh, all I can say about today is is wow. Um, Peter Blexley is our guest. Uh, you might have seen him on um, Hunted, uh, where he uh, is the main boss trying to hunt down the fugitives. Um, but he used to be an undercover cop, and the story he tells are just unbelievable. It's just... It's, kind of one of the best podcasts we've done because the stories are immense i i sort of had one of those moments i looked around i sort of looked around at you and i realized that i was leaning across the desk with my mouth open and you were completely still with your mouth open when he was telling us some of those stories there yeah. like, it's such a good interview he talks about everything from um I don't know, uh, his, his views on the drug industry he talks about the brixton riots he talks oh, about yeah um he talks about what it was like to be a a, a, a copper in the um uh, 80s, 70s and 80s. Uh, he, he, he's got opinions on everything and it's just, I mean, it's very interesting um, stuff. I, I never knew what really to, to, I kept on saying undercover copper. I don't know whether that was, <laughs> I was going to ask you at one stage, but then he called himself a cop. So I Are you an undercover fine. Bobby? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. It's like, you know, uh, police officer. Police officer doesn't sound right, does it? I don't know. What do you call he, it? He kept calling himself a cop and a copper, didn't he? Yeah. I think he just... Hear what he says and just then pretend you know what you're talking I, I about. I think that's that's the way to do it. Yeah. But so you've already sorry, just quickly, you've obviously if you're listening to this, you've already downloaded it. But listen to the whole thing. It's really, really, really good. I thought. Very good. Um entertaining and um I think they should make a film of his life. I was um, trying to work out how to do it in a in you know, like an ongoing season thing while he was talking, I was thinking, Oh my god, you could have that bit as that bit and that bit as that Netflix. Bit. Yeah, yes. Netflix, sorry, definitely. Yeah. This is definitely Netflix. All right, let's listen to him. This is Peter Blexley. This is just a guide to modern life. Modern life is hard to get just right. It can frustrate you and annoy. And if it does, right into dear love joy. Peter, welcome to my kitchen. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Uh, as with all guests, I've bought you a present. I bought you a nice, expensive bottle of red wine. I say expensive because I know nothing about wine. Do you know nothing about wine? Uh, I know what I like, and oh. I really like red wine. Oh, so. do you? Oh, that's good. Well, so I'm very grateful. Thank um, you. Were you allowed to drink a lot when you were a um, undercover cop? Sometimes it was par for the course. Was it? Because you'd be amongst some very hard drinking company. Some of the guys I met, you know, the gangsters, yeah. they were they were good fun. A lot of them were. They knew how to party. They had a complete disregard for the laws of the land. Yeah. Um, and consequently, they, they, they were fun. But of course, I always had it firmly in the back of my mind that they were on one side of the fence and I was very much on the other, albeit for those snapshots of time, we occupied the same world. So, but uh, when I wake up after a heavy night drinking, a... I can't remember it all, which is which is bad. And B, I always think, oh, why did I say that? I've got such a big mouth. Um, I, I avoid spirits because of that. But I've, I'm a nightmare drunk because I just say stuff. I don't you worry about that when you're suddenly undercover and you've got to, got to keep going with who you are, your character. Of course you do, and especially when I was with some less savoury characters who were gun-toting, psychopathic nutcases, <laughs> and I'm sitting down in somebody's flat or their house or we're in a hotel room, and they're insisting that I take drugs. Now, of course, you want to have your wits about you for exactly the reasons you've just highlighted. Yeah. You're in there to negotiate. You're there to convince them that you are a bad guy, you are one of them and yeah. not actually a warrant card carrying fully signed up member of the constabulary. And so you're thinking, right, do I really want to be sitting here with these people now smoking a joint or taking a line of Charlie when I'm really trying to keep my negotiating head on? So it was always a very fine kind of line. tightrope oh. that I walked. And on some occasions, I would seize the initiative. You know, most undercover cops would have rolled out these excuses like, I've got a heart condition or I'm driving or something like that as to why they won't take drugs. But sometimes there's only so far you can go with that. And on occasions it became an absolute deal breaker. The bad guys would say possibly to the informant that had introduced me, you know, if this guy does not have a bang on this joint, 
then I am utterly convinced he's an undercover cop and this deal won't happen. So then you're forced into a corner and you say to yourself, right, okay, it's a deal breaker. I invariably would roll the joint because I became very proficient at doing that because you could seize the initiative. So if I took the joint and I was building it, what I would do is I would backload it. That is, I would put the, the, the resin or the grass towards the back of the joint and then so the front of the joint didn't particularly have much cannabis in it. And then I would light the joint and have the first couple of bangs on it. So I knew that because I'd made that yeah. joint, the front of it wasn't heavily loaded and it looked to all intents and purposes that I was getting as stoned as them. I've built it. I know where the dope in it is. I'm not going to be as high as they are. And then we hand it round. Can I just, by the way, at this point, just apologise. My cat is meowing There's a, in the background here, which is what you can hear, because we are genuinely in my house, and I genuinely have a cat who's being very needy at the moment. I apologise for that. So, um, uh, well, let's get, let's stay on this, because we're here, the drugs. Did you, I mean, when you're taking coke and doing all that sort of stuff, do you, you obviously have to do it because you have to be part of them. And how does that feel when you're when you're a copper and you know it's a illegal um, and... Uh, so you, you're basically just crossing that line, aren't you? Are you enjoying yourself, though? Oh, enjoying myself, well, um, <laughs> perhaps. I wish I wish I was videoing this. Your look then was fantastic. Yes, um, I think at the end of the day, when pretty serious criminals got taken off the streets and, and sentenced to hefty terms of imprisonment for particularly serious crimes like conspiracy to murder and stuff like that. So you were, in fact, keeping somebody alive that might otherwise be dead. And you saw them go down the steps at the Old Bailey to face a long jail term. Then you'd say, yeah, that's a job well done. But actually enjoying it at the time, no, it was so high octane. It was so adrenaline pumping. And the stakes were very, very high. Because in essence, I was an actor. I was putting on a performance. And of course... The, the price you pay for putting on an unconvincing performance could be one that yeah. might be very serious. Do you think you could slide into acting now? Uh, no, not now, I'm afraid. I'm a bit too long in the too tooth, long, I think. Too. All right, listen, we, we're going to come back to um, undercover business because obviously that's uh, that's the that's the stuff we all really want to know. But the the other side of, of you at the moment is you're a TV star. Um, you're on Hunted. Uh, such a great show. When that concept came along and went on TV, everyone went, ah, brilliant. I reckon I could do that. That was what everyone, everyone's thought. I know how to do it. And that's what makes a great TV show. Did you realise it was going to be such a big success when you first took the job? No. No, we didn't. I think we were very much dipping our toe into the water. And I, along with others, thought that it would spark a completely different debate. We thought the debate that it would, it would create amongst the public was about the surveillance state, the powers of the state in terms of what they can do, the data they can access and all of that. So we thought it might encourage that high brow debate, I guess we can call it that, but it didn't. It, it morphed into something completely different, which is great and is invariably more fun. It became a personality driven show, um, particularly with regards to the personalities of the fugitives. But the question that everybody did ask each other was, what would you do? Yeah. How would you go on yeah. the run? How would you evade capture? Yeah. Which is, of course, a more light-hearted thing, and, and, and that still continues. Well, we see, well, I always think these shows work when my kids, who are teenagers, go, they want to be on it, and they've got all their plans sorted in their head of how they're going to avoid you. And I just think it's, I think it's brilliant when it... And I've got the same theories. We, when we go for a walk in the park, we talk about how we're going to avoid zombies and stuff as well, the zombie apocalypse. So, so it's a sort of family thing we do. But, you know, it's... It, but it's just... It's, when it captures imaginations of the young and old, I think that's when, when you've got a good show on your hands. Yeah, well, it's been very well received. We're, uh, we're currently waiting to see if another series or two will get recommissioned. So we've got our fingers crossed on that. Um, and what do you think about surveillance then whilst we're there? Um, I've, I've got mixed views on it. I, I believe in freedom being the, the most important thing we have. And yet it seems to me that it's doing a good job. What's your, you, you actually put a great clip on the other day. Well, it's not great. It's horrific of a, of, on your Twitter feed of a man who's stealing a purse out of an old lady handbag. It was on CCTV so they could put the, a still of the guy up and hopefully we can catch him. So do you think it's, that's the good thing about it? The, the, it's all benefits. Yeah, CCTV was originally sort of conceived as a crime prevention tool and what it's actually become now is an evidence gathering tool because it's so prevalent. It's almost 
everywhere in our major cities. Um, and I think villains sometimes forget that and consequently some of the foolish ones get captured on CTTV and get dragged in front of the courts and, and that's all good. I think on the broader kind of subject about our data, for example, the data that can be mined about us, um, the data that is held about us, and all of that with regards to our privacy, is is a completely different thing. Um, are, am I happy with it personally? Well, I'm aware of it. I live a life where I have nothing to hide, so I do tend to come from that argument that if you don't have anything to hide, then why should you be afraid of, of, of data being retained? But there is, of course... It's, it's now leaping on so quickly and so beyond my realms of imagination with algorithms, for example. A retailer gets hold of your data and then all of a sudden they can run it through some algorithm and then they start bombarding you with things that they think you might want to buy. That is hugely irritating. Is that an abuse of our data? It's a part of modern life, isn't it? We're, we're kind of saddled with it. But there is a lot you can do to keep your data personal and private though i though i did interview a hacker once who was one of the leading hackers in america and he said uh they said what advice would you give and he said don't do anything bad because i can get it yeah <laughs> and he goes i can get any information and they can he said you can even get a crisp packet in a room and you can take the signal of you pushing your your fingers on a button on your phone and i can start reading what you're doing or whatever i, I it was so complex like that he goes it's ridiculous how complex we can hack now and so he's so you've got to be aware if you're going to use technology we can start looking at it so use a pen and paper maybe yeah and of course there are benefits to it because of course every keystroke leaves a trace doesn't it every every tap on your smartphone yeah. keypad that leaves a trace and in many regards that can be a very helpful thing for law enforcement when they're trying to catch murderers and the like. Yeah. So there, are, there is a balance to be struck, I think. But the genie is well and truly out of the bottle. And in the old days, when I was a detective, if I wanted to get into somebody's house and discover about their life, I needed to get an impression of their front door key so we could get their door key cut. And in the hours of darkness or when they were otherwise away from their property, we could get in yeah. and do that old-fashioned rooting around, snooping about and finding out what we needed to. Now, of course, in the modern era, what do you need? An email address and a password. And you can almost get in and find as much about that person's life through that as you do by getting through their front door. So what's your thoughts then when, when people are, the police want to be able to open up anyone's accounts you know, Facebook accounts, um, Twitter accounts, whatever. And they want to, we, we're saying, or WhatsApp groups, which are encrypted, the police are saying, we want to be able to look at them um, to, you know, for, for uh, various reasons. And the companies are saying, no, we want to protect the privacy. What, where's your view on this? Because it's such a fine line, isn't it? It is, it is. And, and please don't think for a moment that I am a, a fan or a supporter of an all-seeing, all-empowered police state yeah. i am far from that right. you know i think the police need to work very hard to get what information they can about us whether it's be you know people who, who who don't get up to any wrongdoing or it's criminals so i think there does need to be a level of protection when you start talking about communication apps like whatsapp and others one of which is about to be taken down it was an encrypted system for messaging and it, it looks like it's going to be taken down um it must be extremely frustrating for the police to be confronted with a situation where they might know two villains have discussed the absolute most serious criminality through an encrypted system and they can't get into that. But if you look at WhatsApp, for example, you can get the end data. So you can, subject to an application to a court, you can get when it was sent, the time it was sent, and where it was sent from. And likewise, you can get that data about where, where it was received. What you can't actually get is the message content. So, so that data does actually give a detective something to work on. It might not give them the message content, but so in those kind of regards, you know, we, mustn't, we must not live in a police state. We mustn't make it too easy for them. They've got to, they've got to work hard to discover what they can discover. So when you... Um when you're doing hunted, is there any way apart from just sitting in a cave for for weeks on end with no technology and a couple of tins of beans? Is there any way of avoiding being captured? 
Well, yes, unfortunately, as Series 3's just shown, where four of those pesky fugitives evaded capture um, and well done to them. But, of yeah. course, it's hugely disappointing for, for us as the hunters that anybody gets away and gets their grubby hands on, <laughs> on that enormous amount of money. Um, but, yes, you can do. Um, it, it, it is possible. And, and if there, there are some notable criminals who are wanted for murder at the moment that have evaded capture for a long time, couple that appear to have fled to the continent, you know, and, and they very, very much need capturing, but they are managing to operate under the radar at the moment. So, yes, sadly, it is possible to disappear off grid. You do need a support network. You do need funds, and they are weak points that can be exploited. But there are some notable criminals out there that are very much on the run, and I hope law enforcement lay their hands on them very soon. We'll talk about your book uh, later where you, where you do that and you try and track some down, some murderers. But um, uh, is, it easy, is it harder now than ever to avoid, um, uh, to, to escape, basically, to vanish? Well, if you look at the UK, you know, there's 94,000 miles and 63 million people within which to hide yourself. So if you avoid the obvious things, like making contacts with a network that might be monitored by law enforcement, for example, because if you've committed a very serious crime and then you go on the run, the lure of home and loved ones is often very, very strong and is something which has been the undoing of many criminals because they've wanted to reach out to the, the, the ones they've left behind. But if you can go solo and you can, you can cut yourself off from all those kind of previous known associates and contacts and you can go under the radar and you can be supported by a criminal network that are suitably funded and are willing to harbour you, then it can be extremely difficult for law enforcement to find those people, unfortunately. You told me um, when you came on Sunday Brunch that we're the, we're the most watched nation. We've got more CCTV cameras per person, per head or something than anyone else. Is that true? Yeah, well, we are amongst the most watched nations on earth. But of course, that CCTV is only helpful in the hunt for a fugitive if you think you know where they've been. Right. Because, of course, all this footage has to be poured over. It has to be watched by someone to see if there is a positive sighting there. So it's not a cure-all and a catch-all. It's just another tool in the in the weaponry of law enforcement. But it's, it's... It's moving quick, though, isn't it? Quickly, the the way we look, we, we track criminals and things. Do you not think oh, with the, DNA evidence and everything else which is happening, it's, it's moving very quickly? Oh, astonishingly. I mean, if you look now at how major crimes tend to be solved, they're solved through one of three ways. Number one is mobile phones and all the records that you can, you, you can get from those and all the data that, that, that they're constantly spewing out these phones as they're seeking connectivity. So mobile phones is one. CCTV is very much uh, an, another strand to it. And the third one, of course, as you mentioned, is forensic science, you know, and how that gallops forward every single day. There are scientific advancements, probably as we're sitting here speaking now, some incredibly bright person in a laboratory somewhere is coming up with yet another tool to be given to the police in, in terms of the advancements of what DNA can do. You know, it's not so long ago when DNA profiles could first be retrieved and compared that you had to have almost the perfect DNA sample to do that. Um, now, of course, you can take, for example, an item of clothing that might have been involved in, let's say it's some kind of fight or some other sort of serious assault that's led to a murder. If you have a number of people that might have pulled and poured over and ripped at a jacket or an item of clothing, so you've got mixtures of DNA in there now, that DNA can be separated out so that a profile might be able to be obtained from what was once regarded as mixed DNA that was of no use to mm. anybody. So all these kind of advancements are happening at an astonishing pace and, 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 and they're a good thing. You know, if you go out and commit serious crime, then I think the overwhelming majority of us would all be in agreement. That you need to be, you need to pay the price for that. Peter, if I was going to murder someone, I would use um, ice, uh, like I'd, I'd, I'd make an ice sort of like 
a rod type thing, stab them with it, kill them that way, and then the evidence melts. I read that online. Right. And that's the, right. <laughs> is that the best one? I'd stick to broadcasting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let, let's let, let, let's let's tell your story of how you got to be where you've got to. Uh, the the uh, I I know it, and it's a it's a brilliant story. Post you leaving the force, um, you were in trouble. What yes. what what happened? Well. What really signified the end of my career in the police was that I had to go and live in the witness protection program. Some very serious criminals took out a contract on my life, which was discovered on an FBI phone tap over in a bar in Boston. And um, and it was a, a, a very, very serious threat. They were looking to hire a gunman to come to the UK. He had the code name of the doctor. Not particularly original, that I would have said. But anyway, yeah. so this guy they were going to call the doctor... Um, was going to attend the UK with his doctor's bag. That was code for the weapon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and that was kind of okay because getting threatened went with the territory as a cop. You know, both, and, and you don't have to be an undercover cop to get threatened. Of course, sadly, many, many men and women in law enforcement face threats on a daily basis, on a daily basis. But this was very serious. Um, then what happened, unfortunately, was that um, a confidential report had been drawn up detailing my involvement in the operation that had led to this contract being taken out on me. And in this confidential report, my real name featured, as opposed to the code number by which I should have been referred to. This report, and for all you conspiracy theorists out there, of which I certainly was one at the time, this report then got stolen mysteriously from an unmarked police car. So now, this identity that they just had of Peter over in Boston could now potentially be tied up with Peter Blexley and my unusual surname. That, of course, would give them the vital piece of information they needed to nail down exactly who I was, track down where I would be, and carry out the assassination. So when the theft of this report came to light, I was driving home one day after work. It was actually we had quite an early finish. So I'm thinking, terrific, go to the pub, have a few drinks, lovely, going to have a nice evening. I get a phone call on the way to the pub from one of my bosses at Scotland Yard, and he said, don't go home. Oh, right, okay, anybody going to tell me why not? And they said, no, be in at the yard, nine o'clock tomorrow morning, and we'll tell you what it's all about. Uh, so I said, right, okay. Um, they said, um, who do you live with? I said, my girlfriend. They said, right, get her to go to your flat and pack overnight bags for the two of you. She shouldn't hang around there and then use one of your covert in identities, of which I had many, to book into a hotel tonight. Right, okay, right. So you can imagine that might have played on my mind a little bit that night. Um, and the following morning, I didn't get to the yard at nine, I got there at eight, because I wanted to know, quite frankly, what the hell was going on. And a mate of mine at the yard said, have you seen this? And he had the report that had my real name in it and which had mysteriously been stolen from this unmarked police car. So he locked me in an office. He said, have a read of that. And I read it and I was staggered because it detailed all my involvement in the case. My name was repeatedly out there. If it had fallen into the hands of the wrong people, I was nothing less than a sitting duck. So then thereafter, and he said, oh, and there's a copy of it for you. You might want to keep that for future reference. And I thought, thank you very much. It was a bit of an insurance policy, really. So I tucked that in my pocket. I then had meetings with very senior management at the yard that day. And essentially, it was agreed that I had to move into the witness protection program. And so began a very dark era of my life. Okay, you said mysteriously uh, got in the hands of um, uh, these people and leaked. Do you think then someone wanted to get you out of the force of the case? Or do you think someone had bought off other policemen or something? What do you think? Well, I, I guess I'm probably never really going to know the answer to that. Um, but once I was living in the witness protection program, I had an awful lot of time to ponder over that. Yeah. Um, and I didn't cope with living in the witness protection program at all well. I drank too much. I smoked too much. I, I had too many conspiracy theories bouncing around in my head. And to cut a long story short, I was on a slippery slope to, to becoming really ill and I ended up having a complete and utter meltdown which led to me being hospitalised in a lock-in psychiatric ward and it really 
sort of signaled the beginning of the end of my police career. What's it? What's it like knowing there's someone out there who wants to kill you? And because you say people go through, policemen go through that all the time, or police officers go through all the time. But what about when you know it can actually be a reality? What's it feel like? Yes, it's very unpleasant. You know, living life looking over your shoulder every day is really not very nice at all. And and being in constant fear of the assassin's bullet is unpleasant. Um, checking under my vehicle every day for devices. You, you know, what the neighbours must have thought, I don't know. Are you literally looking at people in pubs going, is this the guy? I, I did in the end. That was part of my kind of paranoia, really, which which led to my, my complete um, sort of meltdown, really. But it, it, it was... It was very unpleasant. I've always been quite a, a neighbourly and outgoing sort of guy, but suddenly I'm parachuted into this neighbourhood where I knew nobody and I had to just lay a lie upon lie if any of the neighbours said, oh, hello, and where have you come from? And, oh, so you're new, and what do you do for a living? And all that kind of stuff. It was like, please, no, I don't want to start these conversations because it was just layering a lie upon a lie upon a lie mm. all the time. I'm thinking, you know, is somebody going to creep up behind me and stick one in the back of my head? And, um, and of course, at the time, believe it or not, I was still working undercover. So in any, in any one day, I could be three different people. Wow. Right? So I'd wake up in my safe house, right? The, my bolt hole, my hideout. I'd wake up there and the post would be on the doormat. And of course, that would be in the name that I was living in the hideout in, okay? So that's my one identity. I'll get in the car and drive to work after I've checked underneath there, of course, right? Drive to work. And for that hour or so, I could put the radio on and I could actually be myself for an hour. Listen to some tunes, listen to some chat and enjoy that hour. Even sitting in the traffic, it became my favourite hour of the day. Because then when I got to work, it was like, <laughs> right, new identity, go off, what am I doing today? Am I buying drugs, guns, plotting to kill someone, <laughs> buying a lorry load, all that sort of stuff. Then get back home to the hideout. And so it all began the following day. It was lunacy, three different people in any one day. I'd get to the checkout in the supermarket and go to pay for something with a card. And I'm thinking, what blooming name card have I just handed wow. over? You know, it was like, oh, it, was, it was it was unsustainable. It was ill thought out and, and it was only ever going to end in a in a horrendous car crash. So, so, uh, when I met you, the few times I've met you, um, you've always talked about getting the villains. You, you obviously got into the uh, force for the right reasons and that, you know, to be to, to put the villains away and stuff. Do you feel after it ended up with the car crash that we were looking after you as in our country, the police and force and everything? Yeah, it, it, uh, I did leave there. I, I left the police service a very different man to the one that went in, obviously. Um, I, I don't know how much wiser I was. I was really quite embittered, to be honest with you, when I, when I left, because suddenly I was 39, 40 years of age. The career that I thought would see me through virtually all of my adult work in life had been, well, had disappeared. Um and I felt I was a bit on the scrap heap of society with an ongoing battle to stay well. Um, so yeah, it was it was a it was a pretty dark time. It's a messy business, though. Can anyone come out of being an undercover undercover cop sane? Yes, some do. They do. Okay. Yes, yes, so it's some possible. Do. Yeah, not every undercover career uh, ends in in um, what should we say in, in unfortunate circumstances, right. although some do. Yeah. You know, and be warned if anybody out there is thinking of pursuing a career as an undercover cop, you will have some truly unforgettable times. You will have an amazing, astonish, astonishing and exciting career, the like of which very few people get to experience. But beware, the casualty rate amongst undercover cops is notoriously high. Casualty in mental health or Yeah, yeah casualty life in, and in death. terms in terms of mental health. Yeah. And, and potentially career damage as a result of that. Yeah. So what got you to the stage where you decided to start writing books about it and ended up on the TV? Well, yeah, so I came out of the cops and I, I, you know, I felt I had a bit of an axe to grind, to be perfectly honest with you. And I felt I had a story to tell. So I thought I would um, see if I could get my autobiography published. And I was fortunate enough to get, get a publishing deal for that. 
that came out in about 2000, 2001. And, um, and it's open doors that I still walk through today, fortunately. Um, it's, That's Gangbuster. Yeah, the, the Gangbuster. The, the yeah, Gangbuster, yeah. yeah. Which, which got released in January 2017 and proved to be quite popular again. It's a bit of a, a timeless tale in so much as that it is a snapshot of the 80s and the 90s and a, and a life undercover and, and what happened to me. And after that... Sorry. <laughs> we can tell we're live. Uh, go on. Sorry. Yeah, and, and, and after that, I got involved um, as a story consultant to a BBC drama. Yeah. There was a show called Murphy's Law on at the time with uh, a wonderful actor called James Nesbitt playing, yeah. playing the undercover cop. And they'd done a couple of series of it, and it was very much a cartoon caricature kind of show. You know, one week he'd be an undercover astronaut or something, or one week he'd be an undercover nun or something. I'm being yeah. a bit flippant, obviously, but it, <laughs> it wasn't quite anchored in reality. Yeah. Um, and then, then, then they got the third series recommissioned, and, and the BBC and the production company both realised they needed to reinvent the show. One of the writers was familiar with The Gangbuster, got me on board, uh, and, and I then consulted on the next three series of it. Okay, um, so you, uh, you must be able to make your story into a, a movie or a, has anyone approached you yet, a movie or a series, Netflix? There, there's, there, there's been there's some been tentative talks. talks about it, um, you know, but nothing's, um, nothing concrete has we, been nailed on. We've missed a bit of a chunk because you, you went through a car crash, as you said, and you got um, had a breakdown, got depression yeah. and stuff. Uh, I think this is an important lesson for people. How did you get to be back to being Peter Blexley? Well, um, I was very fortunate to receive some wonderful treatment from the psychiatrists and the nurses and the other uh, health staff there. Um, I, I still take medication to this day because I've had a couple of wobbles in the ensuing years. Um, and I'm extremely fortunate that, you know, they found medication that works for me. I take a low maintenance dose tablet every night before I go to bed. My kids know I do. Of course, my wife does. I don't feel stigmatised about it at all. I'll do whatever is necessary to keep me well, keep me happy, keep me working and being a functioning member of society. And if that means that I take some medication that, that keeps me well and, and that's fine, then so be it. But it's been a, it's been a long route. There has been some, some struggles along the way. But, you know, if having people to talk to, having wonderful people around me that have cared for me so well uh, and having magnificent help from from the wonderful NHS um, as what's enabled me to enjoy life to the full. You made a decision at some stage, though, that you were going to own your life and not run away from it, didn't you? Oh, most definitely, yeah. I mean, a, a doctor said to me a long time ago that if I wanted to be well again, then I had to stop being all these different people, all these different identities. So that, of course, signalled the end of my undercover career, but that had run its course in any event. Uh, and he said, you have to be Peter Blexley. You know, and I thought, well, in for a penny, in for a pound. My police career was then over. And I thought, I'll go public. I, will, I won't <coughs> write the book under a pseudonym. You know, it will have my name attached to it and my picture on the front cover. Um, and, and I very much entered the public domain. Was there an element of risk to it? Yes, of course. But my lawyers at the time did write to the police some years after this contract had been taken out and all of that. And they insisted that the Met Police did a current uh, risk assessment, you know, a threat level assessment. And, uh, and the Met came back and said that uh, as far as they were concerned, they could find no evidence of the threat being ongoing. Um, did I trust them entirely? <laughs> well, well, well. You know, I took it at face value. Okay, right. Really? At uh, the end of this interview? Thank you for my coming. <laughs> <laughs> There's a knock at the door. <laughs> if there is, Mark's getting it. <laughs> All right, let's uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about how you became an undercover cop. How did you become one? What, what happens? What, what what were you doing before it happened? Uh, well, I, I spent a, a, a few years, three or four years at Peckham in South London as a uniform cop. Um, and then, of course, I had the misfortune to be at the Brixton Riots of 1981. And that had a significant impact on my life, to suddenly be the subject of such hatred over that weekend. It changed my life forever. Um, I discovered that I had a, a, 
uh, an empathy for people that lived an impoverished life and who had policing imposed upon them and who were frankly brutalised, fitted up and otherwise abused. Um, and I decided that I no longer wanted to wear that cloth because I felt it was very much a symbol of oppression to so many people in South East London at the time. So I said, right, I'm going to be... Was, was, was that justified, though? Was, was the force a bit like that back then? Though? Oh, it was horrendous. You know, young black men were fitted up and beaten up almost routinely, you know, in places like Brixton and Peckham. You know, it, it, it was shocking. The practices that, that went on in those days were absolutely appalling. And the riots of 1981 should have come as no surprise to anybody but they did to many because they had their heads buried so deeply in the sand. It was shocking, but it was a catalyst for so much that was good. So then are you struggling when you watch the media and the people who are writing are made out to be the, the, the villains of the whole thing and you can go, well, actually, I understand. I see it from their point of view. I, 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 I do see it from... I'm, I'm not condoning putting a brick through a front window and helping yourself to a 40-inch TV. I'm not condoning that, but I understand the anger and the violence that is sometimes meted out against an organisation that can be seen to be remote and oppressive and not on their side. I absolutely see that. I witnessed it firsthand in 1981, and as you can probably tell, it's left an indelible impression yeah. on me. Um, and, how, you know, did, how, how did the police force get to that stage then? Because they were largely unregulated. And, it, you know, they were coming from that post-war era whereby policemen gave evidence in court and they were believed. Um, there was no form of, of, of regulation, oversight, no checks and balances. So the force was essentially a law unto itself. And, of course, when you had large immigrant populations suddenly arriving in places like Brixton and Peckham, that mainly white sort of lower middle class police service did not know how to deal with that this this population that had suddenly arrived and so they tried to impose policing upon them rather than policing by consent mm. uh, what, what's, we will watch the sweeney I'm, go, I'm slightly moving away from it i'll go back to that but we watched the sweeney. was it a bit like that was the police force a bit wild and a bit the lines blurred a bit between the criminals and the and the police and what you could get away with and things. It was a very testosterone fueled organisation. Yeah, yeah, it very was. And and in those days when I joined the cops, which was the late seventies, essentially policing was a cops and robbers job. It was good guys and bad guys. It bore very little resemblance to what modern day policing is about, whereby the officers officers of today have to deal with all of society's ills um, and you know in, in the in, in the past when we were in the police essentially mental health issues um, you know sex offenses against children um, domestic violence those kind of things weren't weren't on our radar they just weren't things that we dealt with not to mention of course there was no such thing as the internet CCTV and forensic science was in its infancy, I, so it was a completely different landscape. Yeah, I've just been reading Harriet Harman's book, and she was because she's obviously a, a, the person who's fought for women's rights, and she said that domestic abuse was just not blind eye to it constantly. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, get called to a domestic. That's unbelievable you know. now, isn't it? That you yeah. think, think that was the case back then. Absolutely. So, what sort of what sort of child stroke youth were you that thought I'm going to go into the police? What? <laughs> I was um, I was an errant youth. I was the uh, I was the product of a single family. My alcoholic and abusive father left when when I was probably about ten, um, and I was an errant kid. You know, my beloved mum did her absolute very best to put the food on the table and the clothes on our backs, um, but essentially I was just a bit of a renegade, and I got involved in quite a lot of low-level crime, which I'm not particularly proud of, criminal damage, shoplifting, all that sort of stuff. Um, and essentially, well, I left school at 16 without a clue what I was going to do. Um, 
with barely any qualifications to my name. Got a job in a warehouse, which I loved, a good old Woolworths back in the day. Um, and essentially, I was just drifting along there, humping heavy boxes around, you know, day by day and enjoying myself. And um, my mum was very much wanted more for me. And one night I came home and uh, as I stuck my key in the door, there was this enormous policeman sitting in our in the lounge of our flat. And I thought, oh shit, <laughs> right? What, <laughs> what am I about to get nicked for? And my mum's here and all that. This really, <laughs> really isn't good. Well, it was my foresighted mother's idea of getting me a career chat. Oh. And this cop sat me down and sold the idea to me of going into the police. And... Uh, the following day, I went and got an application form and joined the police Jeez. as a cadet when I was 17 years old. So you're in Brixton. Let's go back to there. What What is it like then? You're stood there and you, what, what's actually happening as a the police? There are literally bricks being thrown at you and things. And petrol bombs and every bit of rubble they could lay their hands on. And was the, the police ready for that at all? No, no, no. We were completely caught with our trousers down. I was one of the first units on scene on the Friday because it all started surrounded about a stabbing and then a cop was kneeling on a guy trying to stem the flow of blood. Um, and that was misinterpreted as him being arrested, this stabbing victim being arrested. Right. And it all kind of escalated very quickly from there. Um, and then on the Friday night, we were all put into vehicles and we were told not to get out. The, the backdrop to that had been Operation Swamp, which had been when they'd put masses of police officers on the streets of Brixton to basically stop and search anything that moved. And all that did was hike the tension up in the days leading up to that weekend. The tension was absolutely palpable. It was a tinderbox. All of the police's making, um, or in the main of the police's making, of course there were other factors, social deprivation, lack of opportunity, lack of education, and all those factors that led to a largely disenfranchised generation of young black men um, and then when it kicked off on the Friday, it escalated pretty quickly. But it also subsided because we were taken away back to Brixton Nick for a big briefing. Then we were put back out on the streets in vans and cars. And this was the folly of it all. We were told just to patrol endlessly in a loop, route and road up to sort of Tolsill and back down High Street and what have you, just to patrol endlessly in a loop. And all we were that night was a red rag to a very angry bull. Right. Because there was hand gestures, and I'm talking about going both ways here and abuse and all that sort of stuff. But we were told, do not get out of your vehicles, but patrol endlessly, incessantly, round and round and round. And all that did was heighten the tensions. And we saw people preparing petrol bombs, you know, carrying milk crates of the old milk bo glass milk bottles. And we could see this going on and we're radioing that in and they're saying, do nothing, do nothing, do nothing. So when it really exploded the following day um, on the Saturday, it came as no surprise to any of us who'd been there on the Friday. And it was it was horrendous. People wanted to kill us, you know, plain and simple. And the, the cloth that I wore, I saw what a symbol of hatred that was to people who were standing not very far away from me, who wanted to take my head off but they didn't have any understanding of who I was. They just saw me as a symbol of hatred and oppression and consequently they wanted to kill me. And um, it left a deep, deep mark on me. So what sort of mark? Uh, I decided I wanted to get a uniform. I no longer wanted to wear that, that cloth. And um, the following day when I got, well after but the what, weekend, Sorry, were you on your own on that? Or did, uh, did, did your other uh, mates in the force think the same? or? We, Please don't think that the police were ones to sort of overly intellectualise stuff in the 1970s and the 1980s, <laughs> right? Right? And weren't that kind of organisation. It's moving forward, fortunately. But didn't you... Was there any side of you which, before you'd watched, witnessed it, you felt the same as everybody else? Like, well, this is the way, this is the way we're doing it. This is the... After that weekend, if I had turned around to my colleagues and said, I feel that wearing this cloth is such a symbol of oppression and hate <laughs> yeah. that I could no longer wear it. No, but I meant before the weekend, were you feeling the same as because you say okay i understand it's oppression but were you feeling were you feeling racist basically yeah yeah yeah. before oh, the, then yeah yeah the police service had turned me into a vile racist thug fairly quickly and fairly effectively 
Um, and, it, and it's something for which I still now, as I speak to you, hang my head in shame. Um, that's what the organisation and the peer pressure and all of that did to me. But the, so the, the events of that weekend in Brixton were, were, were huge. And, you know, I, I never uttered another racist word or had a racist thought or anything ever since. It, it, was, it was a truly, truly significant mm. moment for me. I can tell. Um, so then you just, you just applied to you to become an undercover cop. Yeah, well, I, I applied to become a detective. So you then have to sort of serve your apprenticeship in plain clothes. And I did that and then got selected as a detective. And then I went to Kensington, which was a completely different arena to, to Peckham. With, with, um, with Who's at the door? I apologise for that. I'll uh, just... just uh... So, Mark went to the door. Okay, I wasn't going to go to the door. It's not, not a chance I was going to go to the door. Mark went to the door. I'm sitting in the kitchen just with Peter. What happens next? I can't reveal right, right now. Did Mark survive? I mean, who could it have been? It could have been someone from America. That's all I'm saying. Um, if you want to contact us, uh, my email address is at Tim Lovejoy. You can, uh, um, sorry, that's my that's my Twitter name. My email address is dearlovejoypodcast at gmail.com. You can subscribe to us, rate us five stars. We've decided to put this um, uh, podcast into two parts. It was very long, but it's really worth it. Part two is unbelievable. Find out also what happens to Mark.